Hello, and thanks for stopping by. With it being well into autumn, and the days growing ever dark and cold, I think it's time we explored another collection of London pubs. The cosier, the better in this case. The ones we'll be seeing in this video are all snug and tucked away off the beaten path, making them the perfect places to enjoy a drink and a spot of warmth. I might even throw in a bit of a ghost story. So then, let's go and see what we can find. We'll begin in Hammersmith, down by the River Thames. It's a bit chilly here, but bear with me as there's a pub close by which really is worth seeing. This is the Dove, which you'll find tucked away on the narrow eastern end of Upper Mall. Although it looks pretty compact on the outside, you'll see that the pub stretches back a fair distance once you enter, and if you head all the way to the back, you'll find a balcony which offers a splendid view of the river. Along with this, the Dove is famous for having what's believed to be the smallest public bar in the world. It's even been listed in the Guinness Book of Records. That bar being this tiny 33 square foot space, which is squeezed into one of the pub's front corners. The story goes that this bar was shoehorned in in 1911, when the landlord thought he had to have at least two bars present in order to maintain the pub's license. He was mistaken though, it wasn't a requirement. The origins of the Dove are somewhat mysterious, for it's unsure when exactly it was established. The earliest reference to it I've been able to find dates from December 1773, when an auction of household furniture was listed in the public advertiser. The items in question having belonged to a Mr. Crossard, a shopkeeper whose business was described as facing the Dove public house near the Upper Mall Hammersmith. It's likely the Dove was around for a good few years before this though, and for many decades it was also described as being a coffee house, although it did serve alcohol too. It was taken on by a brewery in 1796. Fullers are the current owners, and I have to say, the staff at the Dove, when I visited, were wonderful. I've visited many pubs in London over the years, and this is, by far, one of the friendliest. It's been claimed that, in its earliest days, the Dove was frequented by King Charles II, who liked to take his mistress, Nell Gwynne, who we'll be seeing more of later, here on countryside jaunts. It's difficult to prove this though, because, as already mentioned, it's not known when exactly the Dove was founded. Although there is one definite connection with nobility, right opposite the Dove is Sussex House, which dates from 1726, and was once owned by Prince Augustus Frederick, son of Queen Charlotte and King George III. Apparently, Prince Augustus maintained what was known as a smoking box beside the Dove, which suggests he'd like to pop down here for a quick puff. For roughly 100 years, a period spanning from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century, the Dove's name was pluralised to Doves, as various sketches and photos from that era show. According to legend, this change in name came about in around 1860, when a sign painter got a little too carried away with his work and added an extra dove to the board. For many years, until the Thames flood barrier opened in 1984, this part of the river was prone to flooding. The worst such incidents of which occurred in 1928, when the water in the Dove crept up to waist height. This brass plaque in the tiny bar marks the level which occurred that year. Many famous people have been associated with the Dove over the years. It's said that, in 1740, the Scottish poet James Thompson wrote the lyrics for Royal Britannia here and Graham Greene, Ernest Hemingway, Dylan Thomas, Ingrid Bergman, Boris Karloff, Alistair Sim, Terry Thomas, Joan Sim, Diana Rigg, Alec Guinness, and many, many more have all enjoyed the drink here. As did the Victorian textile designer, William Morris, who lived just a few doors down from the pub. A friend of William Morris, and a fellow who, as this blue plaque shows, lived right next door to the Dove itself, 
was Thomas James Cobden Sanderson, who in 1900 established a publishing company called Dove's Press, named after his local. Thomas took on a business partner, Emery Walker, who created a font known as Dove's Type, which was used in all of their books. Unfortunately, the pair had a bit of falling out, and after a legal battle relating to who owned the rights to Dove's Type, Thomas chucked all of the printing gear into the Thames, essentially destroying the font forever. Incredibly though, in 2014, a painstaking search of the riverbed was conducted, which resulted in the salvage of many of the printing blocks, thus allowing the long lost font to be digitally resurrected. Sticking with books and literature, George Izzard, who was the Dove's landlord from 1931 to 1965, wrote an autobiography entitled One for the Road, which detailed his experiences of running the pub. And in 1930, the Dove appeared in Sir Alan Herbert's novel, The Water Gypsies, although in that story, he decided to rename it The Pigeons. There are plenty of nice pubs around Covent Garden, although this one, the Nell Gwynn, is by far the trickiest to find, for it lies towards the southern end of a discreet alley called Bull Inn Court, which runs between Strand and Maiden Lane. The name Bull Inn Court refers to the first tavern established at this site, the Old Bull Inn, which opened in 1667 a time when property developers were beginning to build new premises towards the west of London, in the wake of the Great Fire, which had devastated the city only a year before. The Nell Gwynn, as it stands today, was established in 1849. According to an advert promoting its opening, the tavern was fitted up in the style of the period in which she, Nell Gwynn, lived. This means the pub would have been decked out in 17th century decor, which I suppose made it an early example of a theme pub. Nell Gwynn was of course the celebrated comic actress from the Restoration period, and if you're familiar with Restoration comedies, you will know that they could be very bawdy indeed. Nell had started out as an orange seller at the Theatre Royal Jury Lane, before moving into acting, and was known for a sense of humour, her beauty, and overall good nature. Pretty witty Nell, as Samuel Pepys once called her. These qualities brought her to the attention of King Charles II, with whom she embarked upon an affair. In the late 19th century, this pub was owned by the Swiss Italian entrepreneurs Agostino and Stefano Gatti, who also owned the neighbouring Adelphi and Vaudeville theatres. In 1885, they installed electricity at the Adelphi, which, along with the Savoy, made it one of the first buildings in London to be lit by the new technology. Apparently, their generator for the Adelphi was based in Bulling Court, where it used to noisily chug away. The original stage door for the Adelphi was also located in Bulling Court, although there was a VIP entrance for the most notable actors just around the corner on Maiden Lane. It was at this spot, on the evening of the 16th of December 1897, that the celebrated Victorian actor William Terrace met, as this plaque says, his untimely end. William Terrace had been acquainted with a fellow actor, a man by the name of Richard Arthur Prince. William had in fact been very good to Richard, helping him secure roles and slipping the struggling actor the odd bit of cash whenever he was down on his luck. Sadly though, Richard was a heavy drinker who suffered from mental illness, and following a violent outburst in the lobby of the Vaudeville Theatre on the 13th of December 1897, he'd fallen out with William, after which he decided to take his brutal and unwarranted revenge. Three nights later, as William approached Adelphi's VIP door to prepare for his appearance in a play called The Secret Service, Richard Prince leapt from the shadows and stabbed his mentor to death, twice in the back and once in the chest, like lightning as one witness described it. Following the murder, Richard Arthur Prince remained at the scene and was quickly apprehended. He was later sent to Broadmoor Asylum, where he remained until his death at the age of 79 in 1939. 
The ghost of William Terrace, meanwhile, is said to haunt parts of Covent Garden. In 1975, three men claimed they saw a ghostly figure, dressed in grey, walking towards the Adelphi stage door. And most notably, a number of sightings of the deceased actor have also been recorded at Covent Garden tube station. This is a little odd, considering William wasn't killed here, and the station didn't even open until 10 years after his death. Although Covent Garden tube station was built upon the site of Wild and Robbins, which happened to be William's favourite grocer. On the occasions when his spirit has supposedly been glimpsed here, it is usually by staff, who, as they prepare to close up the station around midnight, are disturbed by a tall, elegant figure dressed in grey and wearing white gloves, who then promptly vanishes into thin air. The Red Lion is, by far, Britain's most popular pub name. I've already covered one example in my series of pub videos, The Red Lion on Whitehall, which I'll link below in case you haven't seen it. The Red Lion we're looking at today is a lovely little place hidden away on Crown Passage, a rather fancy alley in the area of St James's, which runs between Pall Mall and King Street. At this time of year, with its inviting, glowing windows, it's the perfect place to come in and shelter from the cold. The Red Lion on Crown Passage is just moments away from St James's Palace, a grand building which was originally commissioned by King Henry VIII, a goodly manor as he called it, which initially served as a hunting lodge, the hunting ground being what's now St James's Park. Prior to that, the land here had a rather grim history, for it was once home to a leper's hospital. In terms of royalty, the Queen Mother is known to have drunk at the Red Lion on at least one occasion, it was her local after all, and that's most unsavoury figure, Edward VIII, is also known to have come here too. Like the Dove, which we saw earlier, it's also claimed that Charles II and Nell Gwynne used to rendezvous here. They got around a bit, didn't they? According to legend, Charles had a secret tunnel dug from St James's Palace into the cellar of the Red Line to facilitate their illicit liaisons. This is nonsense of course, although the cellar is named in Nell's honour, and she did live very close to here, at a house on what's now 79 Pall Mall. Sadly, it was here that Nell died in 1687, aged just 37, her health having deteriorated following a stroke. She's buried at St Martin in the Fields Church. The Red Lion, as it stands today, dates from the early to mid 19th century, although there's been a tavern at this site for some 400 years. It's stated that the pub boasts the second oldest license in the West End, but as for who owns the oldest, well I have no idea who has that honour. If you know, then please do be sure to let me know in the comments. Located in the shadow of Charing Cross Station, the Ship and Shovel is a good contender for London's most unusual pub, for despite being classed as one establishment, it's essentially split in two, one pub on either side of the alley known as Craven Passage. The buildings in which the Ship and Shovel are spread across date from the early 1730s and were transformed into two pubs in 1852, one being called the Ship and the other the Shovel which was possibly a reference to the men who shoveled coal from barges more than nearby on the Thames. Out of the two bars, the one on the southern side of Craven Passage is arguably the cosiest, and it has an additional seating area upstairs known as the Crow's Nest, which is usually a bit quieter. Unlike the Red Lion, with its claims of a secret passage for King Charles II and Nell Gwynne, the Ship and Shovel really does have its own tunnel. This was added quite recently, in 1998, to connect the two cellars and provide kitchen space. So, although the two pubs appear to be separate, they are indeed physically connected. It was also in the late 1990s that the two bars were brought together under their new collective title, The Ship and Shovel. The Shovel name was slightly amended, 
as you can see, it's now spelt with two L's. This being done as a reference to Sir Cloudsley Shovel, possibly pronounced Chauvel, no one knows for sure, an English naval officer and national hero who perished in a silly naval disaster of 1707, when, during a ferocious storm, four ships were wrecked off of the coast of Cornwall, with the loss of an estimated 1,400 to 2,000 souls. It's a busy place, Kentish Town, but there are some quiet back streets if you know where to look. One of which, Leverton Street, is home to a rather splendid pub, the Pineapple, inside of which you'll find a roaring fire and beautifully etched glass. The Pineapple was established in the spring of 1868, the same year in which Kentish Town Station, located just a few minutes walk away, also opened thus making it a handy place for both passengers and railway workers to stop by for a drink. The pub, along with several shops and most of the houses on Leverton Street, were built by the landowner of the time, a gentleman from Devon named Philip Lusmore. Tragically, just eight years after the pineapple opened, Philip took his own life by stepping in front of a train as it sped towards the freight yards at Kentish Town. As for the pineapple's name, well, there are several pubs in London which use the title, and this reflects a craze for the exotic fruit which existed in centuries past. To put it in modern parlance, pineapples in the 18th and 19th century were seen as bling, gaudy symbols of status and wealth, because, as crazy as it sounds, a single pineapple once cost the equivalent of several thousand pounds in today's money. It was even possible to hire one out as a decoration for a special occasion, although if you did that, you had to resist the temptation to eat it of course. Pineapples also crop up in many examples of architecture. You can see them outside grand houses, on Lambeth Bridge, and there are even two plonked on top of St Paul's Cathedral. Returning to the pineapple in Kentish Town, according to an article in The Londonist, a draft named Zara was temporarily housed in the pub's stable in the mid-1890s, while she awaited transfer to London Zoo. I can believe this, because in the 1820s, the stables at the Dublin Castle, not too far away in Camden Town, were also used to shelter animals from the zoo. And this building, which I'm assuming once formed part of the Pineapple Stables, certainly has a door tall enough to provide access for a draft. In 2001, the long-serving owner of the pineapple, Mary Gates, sold the business on the understanding that it would remain as a pub. Unfortunately, Mary was gravely misled, and as soon as she'd handed the keys over, plans were drawn up to convert the pineapple into, yep, you've guessed it, luxury flats. Understandably, this resulted in outrage, and the campaign to save the pineapple was launched which received the backing of many famous figures, including the director, Ken Loach, the poet laureate at the time, Andrew Motion, and the actors, Ken Stott and Roger Lloyd Pack. Thankfully, the campaign was successful, resulting in the pineapple gaining protection with a grade two listing. And as you can see, it's never been busier. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look at some of London's coziest pubs, and as ever, I'd love to hear your own thoughts. Have you visited any of the pubs we've seen here, and what other cozy establishments can you think of? Please be sure to let me know in the comments. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, then I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider doing so, as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, would ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. Plus, of course, it'd be wonderful to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support my work with a tip via either my Ko-fi account, which I'll link below, or the YouTube thanks button, which appears as a heart icon beneath the video. Any such financial donations are, of course, greatly appreciated, and they really do help go towards creating content. Anyway, on that note, thanks again for watching, friends. Stay well, and please be sure to stay tuned.